Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is John Tucker from Woodland Trust. I'm chairing this session it should be Emma Gill Martin who uh, was going to chair this today, but unfortunately she's ill, so I'm taking over from her. Um, this session is on wood meadows and wood pasture, very much an introductory session to that topic. We've got two fantastic speakers here who I think are going to talk for probably around 15 to 20 minutes, um, so that will leave us plenty of time for questions at the end. So without further ado, first speaker, um, Dan Khan, who's a wood meadow specialist for plant life, and is going to look at an introduction to wood meadows. Over to you. Yeah, as, as John said, my name's Dan Khan. I work as wood meadow specialist for plant life. My role basically involves promoting these kind of ancient, traditional, what were agroforestry systems, wood pasture and wood meadow. And I heard a really, I've heard a lot of great talks today, but I heard a sentence, I think it was Hannah, in the, in the farmer-led design tent um, about half an hour ago, who said, some, said a phrase I just loved hearing, because I, I think the point of my job is to get people to think not just about trees, but about what's growing beneath trees. Because when I'm an ecologist, when we're thinking about biodiversity, we talk a lot about ecosystems. And trees are just one element of a woodland ecosystem or a wood pasture ecosystem. And what Hannah said was, we planted all these trees, but before we did that, we thought, what should be going beneath the trees? And I think my life mission is to get it so that everybody who plants a tree asks that question before they get started. Of, I'm good, I want to plant trees. These are the species I want to plant. What's going to grow beneath it? And do I need to give it a helping hand, depending on what my, my kind of aims are for a project? So I'm going to take a few steps back and talk quite top level about woodlands, wood pastures, wood meadows. And then Dan, I think, is going to go in more into the nitty gritty of practicalities. Um, so, first question, what is a woodland? What do we mean when we're talking about a woodland? There's a picture of a woodland. We know it's a wood because it's got lots of trees. <coughs> Seems like a very obvious question, but actually it's quite an interesting answer that we have a specific legal definition of what constitutes a woodland in a UK context. Um, and that's the forget the name of the, the organisation, but it doesn't really matter. The um, National Forest Inventory describes a woodland as an area of trees where the canopy cover is at least 20% canopy cover. So you can have an area that's 80% grassland, but legally, it's still a woodland. Most of the woodlands that we plant look much more like this. You know, fairly dense wall-to-wall -wall trees, but I think it's important to reflect on what woodlands have historically looked like in the UK. And we talk, in, as ecologists, a lot about this historic idea of a wild wood, you know, what the UK looked like before humans arrived. And it wasn't wall-to-wall -wall trees across the whole country. We know that. We had a lot of flora, grassland flora, heathland flora, wetland flora. We also had a lot of large herbivores, and we know that large herbivores break apart their habitat and probably what we had was something you could describe as woodland, maybe 20% canopy cover, but it was far more open and far more varied. And when we talk about what constitutes a good woodland, what we're actually doing is how well does this, what we're actually asking is how well does this woodland deliver in terms of what I value it for. And sometimes you can value a woodland in terms of timber production, in terms of its carbon sequestration value in terms of its biodiversity. What we don't often do in the modern context is value woodlands in terms of their importance for livestock, for shade, for shelter, for fodder. But historically, before humans arrived and after humans arrived, until relatively recently, grazing has always been a very present aspect of woodland management in many woodlands in the UK. And when we talk about what constitutes a good woodland, so I'm an ecologist, 
what constitutes a good woodland for me means a, a woodland that's rich in wildlife. You hear ecologists using these, these kinds of terminology <coughs> to talk about habitat mosaics. They talk about messy edges. They focus very heavily on actually the bits that aren't easily categorized, the bits that aren't just solid uniform trees, but the edges and the open spaces. And whenever you're trying to create good habitat of any kind for wildlife, one easy way to think about it is thinking, if wildlife's pernickety, it's ridiculously pernickety individual species. They have very particular requirements as to what they like to live. And we call those niches. If you have a woodland that's very uniform, there are some things that might do very well, but the variety of niches is going to be quite narrow. If you have a woodland that's very varied, if it's a habitat mosaic, you're going to have a far broader diversity of conditions that supports a far higher diversity of species. So moving on to wood pasture, a wood pasture is a wooded area at the broadest possible level that is grazed. And within the context of agroforestry, we sometimes give it quite a narrow definition of this is wood pasture, this is alley cropping, this is grazed forests. But really, they all fall under a far older definition, and that's a wooded grassland or a grazed wooded system. It's not quite as catchy as all of the names I just said, but we shouldn't be surprised that biodiversity thrives when we create agroforestry systems in wood pastures because that's very similar to what the natural landscapes of the UK would have been before we started meddling with them. So we're quite lucky in the UK. We do have quite a large proportion of Europe's wood pasture resource, but we have lost quite a lot as well. We've seen a lot of areas like this. So you look at this. Is this a woodland or is this a wood pasture? Right, it's dense wall-to-wall -wall trees. It's not grazed. Legally, it's a woodland, but actually you can see that there are some trees that are much bigger, that, that used to be open-grown trees, that are suffering from very young regrowth of trees that's actually, in the long term, is another example, killing the open-grown trees. Because this is a wood pasture where management has lapsed. And other thing to note is that the field layer has become very, very empty. It's mostly leaf litter in both of those examples. So I, one of the things I like about wood pastures and wood meadows is that they require ongoing management. It's not a situation where you can just step back and leave the land to do whatever it wants. There's a need for large herbivores, therefore a need for livestock. So at a time when tree planting is a really huge industry in the UK, but sometimes it's at the expense of land use for agricultural production, I think it's important to revisit wood pastures and agroforestry systems. That's why we're all here. It's exciting to think about how we can deliver multiple goals with one area of land, biodiversity, carbon, livestock, instead of letting our wood pastures just go to nothing but trees. Because, to be honest, that's probably not even the best thing for carbon sequestration, because those ancient oaks that would have been there for several hundred years longer are going to die and release the carbon back into the atmosphere. Here's another example of a degraded wood pasture. Sadly, a lot of our wood pastures in the UK look like this. It's overgrazed. So beneath those trees is an ancient grassland that's never been ploughed. Ancient grasslands are a very scarce resource in the UK, weirdly. Um, we know we have a lot of grasslands, but most of it's relatively species poor. This, if it were managed differently, could be a spectacular grassland. But when we talk about wood pasture, which isn't a term we really used until the 1970s and 80s, it wasn't a term that people in the UK used at all. We looked at areas like this and we said, oh, that's a bad grassland or oh, that's a bad woodland. We weren't valuing it in its own right. This is an ancient cultural habitat in the UK. It's spectacular. And we have grown far more comfortable with the term wood pasture over the last few decades. And we recognize that those ancient trees do have value. But sometimes we forget that what's beneath the trees is also very interesting, not just from a food production perspective, but also for biodiversity. Here's an example of both both things happening either side of the fence. So on, I don't know if it's right or left for you. For me, the left side of the screen 
is very overgrazed. It's lost species diversity. This is a wooded grassland that a few decades ago would have been managed as one unit. Now one half's overgrazed. It's losing species diversity. It's increasing. You can't tell from the photo. But there's ragwort, thistles, nettles, docks invading that grassland because it's overgrazed. On the right-hand side of the fence, we've got an undergrazed system where the grassland is becoming increasingly coarse, invaded by bracken, but it still has a lot of botanical diversity. It's got bluebells, muscatel, wood sorrel, wood sage, uh, sweet wood ruff, yellow rattle, a, a really nice fusion of what we'd call woodland flowers and grassland flowers. You'd be pleased to know that at least one side of that fence is being restored. So a hay cutting and grazing regime has been implemented. So the other side of the fence is still getting invaded by weeds and overgrazed, which is a shame. So why, why is wood pasture special? For me, obviously those trees have spectacular value, but it's not limited to that. It's the fact that a wood pasture system is inherently a, a habitat mosaic. It's nothing but messy edges. The whole thing is a transition that's not easily defined as woodland or grassland and therefore fits that ideal for biodiversity of supporting a variety of niches. Unfortunately, when you plant woodland in the UK, grazing is, is, is very rarely part of the plan and that's not to single out the Forestry Commission as being the source of all woes. They're a fantastic organisation who've helped us a great deal. But it's standard wording in a forestry woodland felling licence and in a woodland creation grant that the land should not be used for agricultural purposes. And that removal of agriculture from woodland, for me, is one of the leading causes of the degradation of wooded habitats in the UK. We need to think in a more coherent, integrated way about habitat mosaics. So I haven't mentioned a wood meadow yet, which was the title of the talk. So a wood meadow is a very similar concept to a wood pasture. The difference is that a pasture is grazed, a meadow involves an element of hay cutting. And wood meadows and wood pasture systems have been present across the whole of Europe and the UK for thousands of years. They're spectacular. This looks very similar to the, the wood pasture picture, but the reason it's particularly interesting and special for wildlife is that, that hay cutting and collecting creates an extraordinary botanical diversity. So wood meadows are the most species-rich grasslands in the world. If you were to th compare them at a small scale, say, to a tropical rainforest, of max how many species are squeezed into a small space, wood meadows far, far beat tropical rainforest in terms of botanical diversity. So in a single square metre, the most species-rich simple meadows that we have in the UK, so meadows without trees, might have 40, 50 species of plant in every square metre. Uh, there are wood meadows in Eastern Europe that have 76 plant species in a single square metre. They're, they're just silly. Silly diverse. Um, and part of the reason for that is the mixture of light and shade means that plants that we call woodland plants because they're shade tolerant, actually they don't need shade. What the shade does is it limits competition from otherwise dominant species. So in a wood meadow or a wood pasture over the centuries, the shade washes back and forth where you have shade, shade tolerant, stress tolerant, plants establish and then they're left behind as a legacy of the shade and you get this mixed heritage sward that's far more diverse than something that hasn't experienced, experienced that dynamism. In a UK context we've pretty much forgotten about wood meadows. I, I'd never heard of them until a few years ago. I did an interview to promote wood meadows in the UK and I completely <laughs> blagged my way through the interview. Oh, I know, I know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've worked, worked with them all the time. Never heard of a wood meadow. Um, but as I've read, as I've, I've, as I've found my feet, actually there's quite a lot of evidence that historically we had a lot of wood meadow systems in the UK. This is an artist in the 19th century, George Clausen, who clearly had a bit of a penchant for 
wood meadows because he kept painting them. <laughs> so example of somebody hay cutting beneath trees in a UK context. But there are still relics of wood meadow-esque habitat present in the UK. Um, this is a plant life reserve, Jones Hill Farm in Herefordshire. It's a traditional orchard where in between the trees and under the trees there's a hay cut taken in the summer and then aftermath grazing. It's managed as a meadow, but it has trees in it. It's agroforestry, but it's, it's, an, it's a wood meadow and it's extremely, extremely botanically diverse. Churchyards, historically, were also often managed as wood meadows. Here's a Forestry England example. So 2017, 2018, quite a lot of glades and rides were re-established within um, Chiddingfold which I think is West Sussex or North Weald somewhere, somewhere down in the southeast, because that open space had been lost. And in order to maintain the open space, they realised they had to have glades that were large enough to make it safe for machinery and cost-effective for a farmer to go in and take a hay cut and remove the cuttings. And within about two or three years, nightingales, which had been present in the forest but had disappeared but were still within the wider landscape, flooded back in, there's now several pairs centred around these wood meadows in Chiddingfold Forest. So the biodiversity benefits are fantastic. But that's, that's an example of a meadow within a woodland. So it's, it's far simpler, but that, that interaction between the two habitats still exists. Uplands of the UK, a lot of our upland hay meadows used to have a lot of infield and boundary trees. I think it was... Um, Jim O'Neill mentioned earlier about a round field agroforestry. You know, hedgerows and boundary trees are a form of agroforestry. So when we had small field systems, ecologically, they functioned in, in the same way as an infield agroforestry system. Um, and similar habitats exist throughout Europe. This is a Finnish example where it's very sparse pollarded trees. Trees are pollarded as they have been for um, the last two, three, possibly 4,000 years for fodder for livestock. Pollarding trees for winter fodder for livestock has been going on at least one to 2,000 years longer than grass cutting for fodder for livestock has been going on because scythes were only invented, what, 2,500 BC, something like that? Um, more recent than that. Similar examples present in Sweden, but I couldn't find a photo. Um, what Swedes call lovanger or leaf meadows and they're very similar in principle to what we used to call hospital fields or nursery fields in a UK context. Species-rich meadows, usually close to a homestead, where if you had a poorly animal or a pregnant animal, you bring them in close to the homestead and you put them where they can self-medicate. And the Swedes are still using that system on some of their islands. But in addition to having the species-rich meadow, they've got a variety of broadleaf tree species that the animals can eat as well. So if, if wood meadows are so special, why, aren't, why, don't, why haven't you heard about them before now? Where are they? Where have they all gone? Well, they're still quite well known in a lot of European countries, but I think the trouble is in the UK, we industrialised quite a lot sooner than a lot of nations. And whilst it's very easy to scythe around a tree, like this gentleman's doing, it's not so easy to work around a lot of trees when, you, when you're in a tractor cab they've become a hindrance instead of an advantage. For a subsistence farmer, producing multiple products from the land made sense, but we've been moving for decades, more than decades, towards maximising productivity, large-scale systems. We're now learning that there are downsides to that. That's why we're here talking about agroforestry. But that's, that's the reason they've gone. Unfortunately, they're, they're still disappearing. In the uplands, you can still see remnant wood meadows. I, get, I live at the edge of the Yorkshire Dales. I go in and talk to farmers, and about 50% of the time they look at me and say, of course I know what a wood meadow is. I grew up on a wood meadow. They, their farm was entirely upland hay meadows with those infield and boundary trees. Mainly ash and elm on limestone in the Yorkshire Dales. We've already lost all the elm, and every time I leave the house, is a lovely former wood meadow near Richmond where I live, about 30 ash trees felled overnight because people are so worried about ash dieback, they're just preempting it and clear felling. And those livestock are losing their shade and their shelter. And 10 years from now, the cultural memory 
of what those landscapes should look like is going to be gone. Next generation are going to have no idea that the Yorkshire Dales used to be a well-wooded landscape. I find it really upsetting because people just aren't putting the trees back. You can't quite tell probably from the distance you are, but there's loads of snowdrops and violets beneath those ash trees that will survive and they will persist in the grassland provided it's well managed. But they're the legacy of it having been that wooded meadow. And a lot of upland meadows are characterised by wood cranes bill, wood anemone, um, cowslips, violets, bluebells, a lot of shade tolerant species. It begs the question of whether they were more wooded historically. So looking forward, why does this matter now? For me, it, it all revolves around climate change. So I, I talk to a lot of landowners about putting trees in and agroforestry systems, and a lot of the time the reason that they come to me is because their grass yield has become unpredictable. They know that extreme, extreme summers, extreme winters, shade and shelter is important for livestock, but actually also... Because grass yield is unpredictable, their hay crop is unpredictable, and a lot of the time they're having to sell stock because they've run out of their winter hay far sooner than they intended to. And so I think there's an interesting opportunity to look at trees for fodder as standing fodder, just to kind of insulate against those extreme conditions, but also potentially as fodder that we can harvest and, and keep. Um, so wood meadows and wood pastures in various guises could be quite exciting. I think the practical issues of, of hay cutting in between trees haven't gone away. Alley cropping systems, dead easy. You, know, you, you just design it so that you can get machinery around. And to an extent, you can design other kind of diverse systems to accommodate that. But I'm not going to stand here and say hay cutting is inherently superior to not hay cutting. This is an example of a former wooded meadow in the Yorkshire Dales, where it's rocky, it's steep sloped, hay cutting with modern machinery is completely impossible. But what they've done is they just skip the hay cut and treat it as a standing hay crop, introduce the stock for two or three months, late summer, early autumn, and they've managed to maintain that botanical diversity. It's spectacular. Um, I think. For some farms and for some landowners, there's also an interesting question of how you can engage people with these systems because there's, there's that much variety, that much interest, and that we know management's important. So perhaps it's an interesting opportunity to reconnect people with nature and people with food production as well, which I think is straying into Dan's territory slightly. So I'll hand over. <coughs> Thanks, Dan. That, that was excellent. Uh, straight over to Dan Smith. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself I as well, Dan? Do, yeah. yeah. Um, am I on the...? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Dan Smith, um, for a bit of context, I, uh, I'm not an ecologist. Uh, I'm a farmer who loves the silly diversity. That, that's, what I, that's what I want, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, my day job is for a charity called Jamie's Farm, which I'll come on to a bit, which is um, getting inner city children out to, out to the countryside is the kind of the basis of what we do. Um, but we do that through, through farming. Um, and I'm in the Y Valley um, in a particularly rough area. When we went there, we took on the farm. We have farms around the UK. This one was a bit different. We've got a lot of Forestry Commission, a lot of Woodland Trust, a lot of National Trust, and we were looking at ways of uh, kind of growing our acreage in a, in a really healthy way, and that got us into grazing areas that hadn't been grazed for a long time. And actually, the reason that I'm stood here is because I've seen the change from uh, pretty monocultures to the silly diverse. And that's why I believe that this is a kind of something that, that everybody can do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the practicalities. Um, so the f I don't have lots of fancy slides, but the slides that I do have tell quite a story. Um, so what you're looking at there is a picture of my cattle with some collars on, which I'll, which I'll go on to, because there's cattle going into... Um, what I would consider as woodland 
pasture in the creation. Okay, so a lot of these areas, and people might recognise them as, uh, as kind of rough parts of the farm or woodland that, that, that isn't being utilised, perhaps. What you need to know about that is, is that 12 years ago, that was a cyclic spruce plantation. Okay, so it was complete monoculture. That was, that was clear felled and mulched. Um, 12 years later, this is, this is what we have left. It's a 52-acre it's site and about uh, 14 acres-ish was, was cleared. So they have the cattle have access to, to ancient woodland, um, to this what historically was Sickle Spruce Plantation, and um, it is also an ancient monument site. So it's a, so it's a hill fort. Part of the problem with this site is, is it needs to be cleared for the ancient monument, but also you can't really get machinery on most of it, which is, which is another where the, where the cattle came in. Um, the, I think there's quite a difference between woodland pasture creation and woodland, cras uh, woodland pasture management, and, I, and I've split them quite, quite clearly. I think if you're going to be looking to revert back to these things, then we, then we really need to be looking um, at hard mob grazing um, within, within a woodland setting. Um, we need to be looking at scrub clearance within, within a woodland setting. Um, and there are ways of managing livestock without the need for taking machinery into woodlands that, that, that can help you do that. And what I'm going to introduce you to is just a couple of kind of concepts around that, and then if anybody wants any more information, then, then speak to me. So when you, look at a, when you look at a woodland such as this, for example, um, brambles and bracken and things like that, there are very easy methods, i.e. cutting a limb off an ash tree or something that, that needs clearing, that will push cattle into certain areas or push sheep into certain areas. So in that scenario, it's, it's us managing them to create the change that, 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 we, want, that we want to see, essentially. Um, there is bale grazing, so quite an interesting concept of, this, of, of, the, of the meadow, and actually m where it might not be economically viable to take a lot of big kit in to cut hay, there is absolutely a place for cutting hay to then transfer site with seed-rich hay that then you would introduce to things like bracken beds, for example, which, which I'll show you an example of in a minute. Um, there's quite a there's quite a lot of talk about overgrazing or overstocking now. Now, if we're looking for for herd impact to kind of get rid of the weeds, if we might call them that, and and allow delicates to 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 reintroduce themselves, because generally the seed beds there, it's just that it's just that it's so dark or so dense that they're not coming over, uh, not not coming up. Um, Overstocking, to me, is a, is a time frame concept rather than, rather than an, an, an amount of animal, a livestock unit concept, okay? So what I mean by that is, is that I could put 140 sheep in, in this area of this tent for 10 minutes and it would be all right, yeah? Whereas if you left them in here for 10 days, then you've got real problems. And that's what we have to do when we're looking at creation so bringing, bringing woodland, some of the slides that you showed, back into these, these silly, diverse situations, we need to be looking at how we're using the density of our livestock and the time frame that they're in the, in the, in the areas to allow us to create, to create the, these mosaics. Um, the other important thing with, this, with the picture is the, is the genetics involved. I think a lot of the time we... We, uh, we miss the type of livestock we're using for the situation. And there is lots of, you know, we can use pigs, we can use horses. In my situation, cattle are, cattle are better, but we need to be looking at the right animal to be, to be, doing, the, to be doing the job that we need for, for the health of the animal, but also for the health of, of the environment. And actually what you can't see from these cows is they're Australian low lines and they're about this big. So if we're talking about browse lines and, and things like that, we, which, which are important in these scenarios, we really need to be looking at, you know, if we're putting in Holsteins in there that A wouldn't thrive, B wouldn't eat the diversity and lift the browse line to here, they're not, 
they're not useful to us as, as these creation tools. Um, that's an example of, of the diversity that you, that you can get. And again, when we talk about timeframes, you, you have to be very, very careful when, you are, when you're grazing at certain times. Because what you'll see if you enter into this kind of system is, is, that, is that it will change over time, and you have to be really adapt to your, to, to your, you have to adapt your system to the, to the changes that you're seeing happening. Um, I'll go on to the, to the collars, because actually I've heard a lot of uh, chat about them. Um, I'm sure there might be someone here from No Fence. Uh, I didn't buy them. Um, I think they're brilliant, but they do have their limitations. I'm going to touch on that, because I know there's been a lot of interest. Um, no fence collars are great until they come off in the middle of 52 acres, and then you've got to get it back on. Um, one example, again, genetics. My cattle are particularly quiet and particularly easy, so I can talk to them nicely and get a collar back on. Um, but that's also important for the training of them. So, so what I would call daft cattle on these collars, you, you, you're going to really struggle. Um, they rely on solar panels to keep the battery topped up. So actually, if you have a huge amount of tree cover, then you're going to struggle to keep the, to keep, to keep the collars charged. Um, in tree cover, there's a bit the reason I'm hesitating, because there's a bit of debate about this. In tree cover, they sometimes give false readings of where they might be. So if you're setting a, if you're setting a boundary, I haven't seen it in action, but, but I've heard of it where the, the collar thinks that it's outside of outside of the zone, and then potentially you have a you have a welfare issue. I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure on 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 that one. Um, the other thing is is you cannot do the this works here because we're slightly on on the process. You cannot do very the sort of really tight grazing that you that you need to do to get that real disturbance in in the first instance in the first few seasons of grazing woodland you cannot do it because the because basically the batteries run, run out too quickly because they are very sensitive because they're always close to close to a virtual fence line um, the advantages however is is that you can get a lot of data so you can see this is a this is a heat map uh, on my phone of, of of where they're moving and how they're how they're using the site um, the reason it's interesting to me is, as I said, I'm interested in, in, in the health of the whole system, the soils and the trees and the, and, and the livestock. And uh, you just get very fascinating snippets, like when it's really warm like this, they'll be much more in the tree line. And when it's much cooler days or it's raining, they're, they're happy to be outside. And it is quite a good management tool to see some areas they just, not go, they just don't go to at all. Um, the advantage of these collars that a lot, a lot of people miss is that if I wanted to, I could actually exclude them from an area. And when we're talking about management of woodland and, and sometimes delicate species or things that we want to protect, I could exclude, exclude them from, let's say, an acre of that. So you, so you can use them as a, as a management tool like that. Um, I'm just going to skip a couple of them. So let's go eight years down the line, let's say, of of that system that you could see was pretty, let's say, weedy. I'm not so sure, but, but that's what it would traditionally be called. This is um, now woodland pasture that I think could be woodland meadow. Okay, So it is easily 20% tree cover, um, but more so. But when we took this over, it was almost entirely bracken beds. Okay, so using using those methods such as the, the 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 bale grazing and the mob grazing, we've now got it to a point where we are just just running it as as much more of a meadow. Um, and and the reason I'm really showing you this is because of the diversity of what these animals are eating, and actually the diversity in comparison to some of the sides that you showed of, 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 a, of a woodland, okay? And if we t talk about soil health, if we talk about animal health, if we talk about um, ecosystems functioning, like, to me, this within a woodland, you might actually notice in the, in the background there, that's an ancient apple orchard. Um, that is all, all within, within the system. 
Um, that you can manage much more as a as you would a, tra a traditional meadow setting because it's because it's come a, a long way. Um, but again, you have to be really careful with your timings and it's in your time of the year. You have to be really careful with your stocking density timing. Um, and there is an element that, that that is accelerated by mechanical processes, which is where the haymaking actually comes in. Or you can, you can very quickly change what it looks like by, by what we're doing. Um, and I hope that kind of... I hope that gives you some... You can ask me any questions you like about bale grazing or uh, scrub clearance or any of those things. Um, but it kind of brings me on to to my other real passion, which is people in the environment. And we talked about, historically, hay meadows, hay pastures, woodland as being um, people-focused, people, people focused, community focused type places. Um, and I'm only going to touch on it briefly, but, but this is, so Jamie's Farm, we're a charity and we work across seven sites in the UK um, and we have about two and a half thousand children come to us uh, yearly um, and do, do residential stays. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I would have had no idea of the effect of creating beautiful, diverse places can have on people's mental health, physical health, general kind of well-being, unless, unless I've seen it in action. And if there's one thing that I'd kind of ask people to take away slightly is, is actually... If we're doing these amazing things or doing creations of, of new places and things, there is really an opportunity to a whole nother level beyond profits, beyond <coughs> biodiversity net gains, beyond selling meat that, that, that I feel is, is really, really important. And I think we should kind of be taking that into our consideration as, a, as, as, our, as, our, as our thinking framework as, of how to... Um, kind of really capitalise on this excitement that lots of people are, tr are trying to do lots and lots and lots of things. Um, and actually, it, it can be really, really useful. A lot of the stuff we're talking about in terms of management does take man hours. It does take to, to make it happen. And so, yeah, I'm kind of just a little snippet, and I'm happy to talk more about it if people want, but, but that kind of that really human element of getting people back on the land for the for the for the for the good of the whole system as part of a management tool. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Another excellent talk. So um, I've no idea what time we're finishing. So come on, let's crack on with the questions. Just stick your hand up. I think we've got a roving microphone. There's one over here. So question, right at the back there. Um, yeah, so it's just a question about the bale grazing, really. Um, so as far as uh, the sort of green hay strewing that I've done in the past, there's always been a focus on getting the hay um, baled up, moved over to the donor site, and rolled out ASAP. Um, some figures quoting like six to eight hour window. Um, I was wondering what you were doing to, to mitigate that, to protect the seed viability, whether you were just sort of baling less dense or uh, not storing it for as long uh yeah very interesting um had a lot of a lot of success bale grazing by baling traditionally storing it outside not inside admittedly like putting it straight in straight in situ um and then un unrolling in december when it needs to be unrolled and the the seed bed is there we we, we uh there is some seed destroyed, and I'm sure there are more people who are more knowledgeable than me. But actually, seeds are pretty hardy things. You know, they they live in they live in the soil. They live in the, the, that are never used. And actually, um, I've seen it firsthand where you, you know you go and cut a, a hay meadow that's that's beautiful, and then you can transfer that somewhere else. And maybe not in the first instance, in the in the second, third, fourth year, those those seeds will will remain, and, and they will come. Um, the danger with it, and you have to be very careful, is is that don't forget you're you're introducing nutrients as well. So you have to be very careful where you're selecting your hay from, and you really want to see it when it's flowering. Um, you've got to be really careful that you're not introducing too much nutrient into that, let's say, woodland glade, 
to um, to to kind of unbalance the the levels for for the plant the delicate plants that you're looking to cultivate through the through the process that you're doing um i would also say on the bale grazing it's a time frame thing again so for a bale in the winter i would have a bale for a number of cattle but they would not be on that area for more than two days that's the for me that's the kind of cut off they the 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 hoof impact the herd impact the spreading of the bale which we which we unroll and the trampling and the eating and the and the spreading but but if you left them there for a week it it would be a disaster in my you know in my experience yeah thank you i'd add something to that yeah sure um i'd say bale grazing isn't an alternative to green hay spreading that they're, they're two different different approaches that you'd use in different situations um you so with green hay you do want to move it whilst it's green as quickly as possible if what you're aiming to do is get as broad a representation of the community of plants from the donor site introduced to the receptor site and the longer you keep that and the more you pack it and if you bale it some of those seeds quite rapidly denature and they won't be represented but a lot of the grass seeds and the larger seeds like vetches and bird's foot trefoil mm -hmm. are better able to withstand the baling and they do seem, in my experience, they, they seem to come through. Yeah, and I should probably say the bale grazing for me is very much a management choice to create change. So I am bale grazing specifically where there are areas that are heavy, heavy bracken um, or heavy bramble because, because what I'm doing is like it, rather than wasting 100 quid on diesel to go and top it i'm using the cattle to get into those areas by f by specifically feeding them and you can do it with mineral buckets you can do it with rock salt you, you know that but but in the winter i'm using it specifically to get those animals in that area and the trade-off is that i also want to introduce seed if i can essentially that's a great way to persuade animals to go into bracken and bramble that isn't that attractive as it's, fodder yet. It's also, for anyone thinking of it, it's a great way to, to persuade people that have woodland to buy your hay for you because they're essentially you're getting forage um, and if it was just hay, then there would, might be questions over that. But actually, if, you, if there's a whole other level to the practice that you're doing, i.e. introducing seed or, or clearing scrub, then, then there's often a little bit more leeway there. And I often find that with parish councils, for example. Yeah, you know. yeah. Okay, great question and great answers. Um, yeah, gentlemen there, and then I'll come to you after that. Hi, uh, question for both of you gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> in a, a woodland that hasn't traditionally been managed as wood pasture, do you think that there is a case to be made for deforesting that or reducing the canopy cover significantly in order to introduce wood pasture? I'd say it depends on the woodland. If it's an ancient woodland that's former kind of high value coppice with huge floristic diversity, then it might not actually have that much fodder value anyway, unless you dramatically change the species community in the field layer, which would be degrading something that's in very short supply. So that's a situation where it wouldn't be appropriate. But in a lot of situations, I think it, it, it's something we should think about a bit more carefully. And so woodland cover has more than doubled in the UK in the past century. And very few of the woodlands that we've planted have any significant flora present at all because it doesn't arrive unless we give it a helping hand. So a lot of those fairly dull, small woodlands that we have on a lot of farms that are 30, 40 years old, that are too small to persuade a contractor to come in and thin it effectively purely for timber, I think that some of those are ideal for this type of setup because they'd be performing a function for the farm whilst also the livestock would be helping to create a habitat that's a bit more open and varied which helps quite a lot of species we call woodland specialist species. Yeah, I guess I'd ask you a question back on that which is, which is how well do we feel like woodlands are being managed generally? And the other thing that I would comment on is, is that... Um, I've been lucky enough to, to act as a grazier from, for some quite big organisations that bothered to do things like uh, um, have ecologists in and you know, look, at, look at what the change is. Um, and what we're seeing more and more is where the large herbivores are in, are in woodland, the natural regeneration is generally much healthier. 
and potentially comes down to this time frame thing again, but also uh, species in terms of insect life and bird life especially is is really is really really accelerated so much so that that you know scrub man um, mechanical scrub clearance and stuff is becoming more of a thing to to help with that so. Uh, to me, there's absolutely a place for having having her herb, large herbivores in woodland. Yeah. But it needs to be quite sensitive. Because he's the expert. Well, <laughs> no, 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 you're right. It, yeah, it needs you, to be quite sensitive. Yeah. It, it's, it's a tricky thing, isn't it? It's hard to give a very simple message on that one because you can cause harm grazing with any species. Yeah. Um, pigs can be great in small doses. The pigs have been in that secondary wood for four days, I think, at very <laughs> low density. If they were in there for much longer, or if they were a larger number, you'd need to start supplementary feeding them. Yeah. And that's going to have quite a negative impact on the field layer from a biodiversity perspective because of the nutrient input. And likewise, cattle and sheep behave in different ways and influence their surroundings in different ways. So mm. I think you need to look at the site and you need to... What we really need is for there to be accessible advice for landowners so that they can find somebody to talk to to come up with a management plan for an individual farm because th there's increasing amounts of information out there that we can read but actually there are quite whilst your management might be simple there are quite a lot of factors to take into account that means it's quite confusing I think it limits uptake because of the lack of advisors that are out there yeah and it, it kind of just on woodland management specifically, and I haven't heard a lot, to, but but deer and and we have a huge amount of wild boar in our area, the biggest population in the UK. Having cattle in woodland keeps both of those away, which you know has a has has another effect. Excellent. Sorry, we'll come to you next. The man has got the microphone in his hand already. Fire away. Thanks. Hi, hi there. Um, on your slides, we saw a few examples where you were creating wood pasture from existing woodland. Mm -hmm. We saw a situation where you had some cleared softwood mm -hmm. and you were now grazing the secondary vegetation. Mm -hmm. And we saw another one where you were trying to restore what looked like a degraded old wood pasture. Mm -hmm. I didn't see many situations where you were introducing new wood pasture through new planting and if you have got any examples and you can explain the techniques you used to do it successfully I'd be really interested uh, yeah uh, you, you're right partly um, partly because we were trying to keep it specifically on this but it, a brilliant question um, and I, I, I love the kind of inter intercropping and, and sort of systems like that where you can do that um, the uh, I'm not very good with straight lines, which some of that introduces. You know, it, we, there's, a, there's the kind of restrictions that we put on that. The, the best way that I've found and the simplest way for anyone to do it, even in a, um, in a very traditional field setting, I've had a lot of success with using cactus tree guards. And when I see saplings, I will just protect them. And you know you can mob graze around them. You can, and and I and I hope that that will introduce a, a kind of self-regenerative woodland pasture. It will it will take a lot longer, but 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 that's my hope on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I most of my projects actually fit into that category rather than kind of restoring wood pastures, and they all look very different from one another. I talked a lot about traditional wood meadow and wood pasture systems, and what, what I should have said is that we, the fact that we don't have a really strict, tight cultural definition of what a wood meadow is in the UK, we should look at that as an advantage because we don't have to make them all look the same. We can take farm by farm, thinking about practicalities of what system works based on each farmer's objectives. So. Some of the systems that we've worked on have been straight line, orchard meadow, timber production type meadow sites where you can get machinery in between the trees. Others have been looking to reinstate more of a um, chaotic wood pasture mosaic. And there's, there's always a balance to be struck between, from a biodiversity perspective, you want it to be as varied as possible and just management logistics and tree protection and yeah cactus guards are great um i 
on a similar vein, there's a site not a million miles from you in Moley Valley in Herefordshire where they had a silage field that was kind of winding, followed a river, interspersed with lots of woodland. So a, a nice grassland, woodland mosaic at a landscape scale where it had quite a lot of bumpy bits and boggy bits and it was taking far longer than the landowner really wanted to take that silage cut. And they decided to restore the whole thing to meadow. But about 10% of it, they've just stopped cutting. They just don't take the hay cut on that 10%. They still aftermath graze, so it gets picked up by the same animals that they'd be feeding the, the hay to. And they do exactly what you just described. If they, they wander through the site before they put the cattle in and see where are the tree seedlings, whack tree guards on them. And so by reducing the amount of time that they spend on site managing it, they've created a system that's actually more complex and in the long term is going to provide value for the livestock. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this lady in the front here. Thank you. I was actually going to ask about um, uh, how you start one from scratch, and I, I like the idea of the cactus tree guards. But when you're doing that, do you strip the competition grass away around those little saplings? Uh, I use my wool because it's worthless. So I use, I use sheep wool as a, as a mulch before <laughs> a mulch. I put, yeah. Or, or I suppose you can put wood chip down. Yeah, it, yeah anything. Just to give it an action, yeah, just to give it a bit of extra, extra help. And if you, if, if I, like everything that I'm just doing on my farm is all according to grants. So it's either going to be set aside or it's going to be woodland creation. Or it's, and so I couldn't find anything like this or a cob orchard, for example. There's quite a limited palette at the moment, but mm -hmm. I understand that's going to change. But I could just sling some cactus guards on these fields, on my fields, and it's not going to affect my GS2 payments. Provided, but scrub wood. Provided you don't exceed 20% canopy cover, in which case you, you run into having to go through an environmental impact assessment with the Forestry Commission, potentially. You can introduce trees to a cropped or a grassland system, and it doesn't class as you having changed what you're doing with the land, provided you're not changing what you do with the land. It tends to go quite close to the... The little saplings tend to be seeded from the hedges, yeah. which mean they're quite close to the hedges. Would, is, it, is there a, a sort of an integrity to leaving them where they are from a purist perspective, or should I move, move them into the field so that I they're further away from the shadow line? I think... Um, I, I wouldn't want to give a kind of a specific answer across all situations to that but certainly if, if you've got a system where you can accommodate a leading edge coming in from a hedgerow having that transitional zone can be really valuable for a lot of biodiversity because you end up with areas that you can't quite cut when you do the hay cut which means you've got winter refuge areas for invertebrates mammals reptiles nesting birds um, things that are particularly suffering in the UK like um, nightingale, um, turtle dove, are both associated with billowing edges coming out from hedgerows at the edge of fields. So that, that definitely can have value. Um, what was your question before that? It was um, that, that, that you asked was to start with. Was it about introduce, when do you introduce, well, like I'm doing hay meadows and I'm trying to do calm restoration. Would you do that before? You uh, let the saplings go. To do with mulching. I'm oh, yeah. also a big believer in mulching. I think it's great. But sometimes you're working on a scheme where it's 400 or it might even be 2,000 stems per hectare in places. And mulching at that scale is expensive and logistically challenging. I have worked on schemes where people have planted straight into grass and the grass has obviously competed with the trees and reduced tree growth. But I've also worked on schemes, and one that, that Wood Meadow Trust set up 10 years ago, um, which is now managed by Plant Life, where it's an ex-arable field, extremely nutrient-rich, phosphate levels between 3 and 5.5 still. Um, not the sort of site where you'd look at it and say, that's an obvious wildflower meadow. <laughs> and they established a stale seed bed before sowing a wildflower meadow mix, so they got the weeds under control, established the wildflower meadow mix, and then planted trees straight into the grass. No deep ploughing, no mounding, no mulching, no spot spraying. 
and the tree mortality was six or seven percent and the tree growth compared to every other woodland planted in the white rose forest in the same year is comparable if not faster than everybody else so there are situations when you can plant trees straight into grassland and they they don't suffer for it in fact sometimes wonder whether the, in drought years grass might help retain moisture a little bit better but um the other thing is you're talking about self-set trees which do grow faster than planted trees anyway okay. um, yeah. any more questions so oh right hands up yeah hi thank you really interesting talks Dan, could you talk a little bit about the site you're on now? What did it look like before you started managing it in this way, and what was the journey like? Uh, yeah, happily. Um, so actually, the, the site where our home farm is, let's say, um, we have introduced an awful lot of hedging and herbal lays, and now beginning to um, beginning to, to, to create pastures from, from, from woodland pastures from nothing. Um, the, the sites where I'm doing a lot of the what we call restoration are, are not owned by us. So we are kind of going in as, as graziers. Um, depending on the site, because there are lots of, it's over about 250 acres of quite kind of diverse, but the, the, the forest of Dean Y Valley is incredibly heavily treed. Um, and they are uh, I mean I'm quite proud of them in that when, when some of them especially you go to and it was just wall to wall bracken you know and even in the space of three years you can, you can flip that around to these kind of really incredibly diverse ri rich places um, and it is just management you know and, and the you know there are there are you you are more guided on certain their their triple SIs, but like the ancient monument, you're a bit more guided. But actually, we're we're really seeing improvements even within within those frameworks. And where you're doing the restoration grazing, um, do you know anything about the finances of who's funding that to happen? Are they getting things like the biodiversity net gain or uh, not is it charity funding? <laughs> Charity funded to some degree, uh, private landowners who are incredibly interested in it. Some are probably interested in biodiversity net gains and uh, things like that, but actually a lot of them because, because they've seen it and they've seen what we're producing, they've seen the human effect, they've seen the land effect. A lot of people very interested in their soils beyond kind of payments um, and, they're, and, and you know, you just come and look and you can see it, and, and that's what gets the people like, oh yeah, okay, we, we want to have a go at this. Yeah. Next question. Um, we've recently bought a farm that looks a bit like some of the pictures you showed underneath. With, it, it, it was ostrich farm 25 years ago, and it's been naturally regenerating itself um, with no management at all. So there are parts that look woodland pasture, and there are parts that are really, really dense with oak trees. They do have other trees in sort of some glades that have rapidly will get shaded out. So as I've seen the oak trees, I think you said that you um, chipped them. I'll do some woodland piles, I guess. I'm just trying to work out what the best thing to do with the oaks that I chip are. I'll, I'll keep the other diversity, like the hawthorns, crab apples, blackthorn. We do, by the way, have lots of nightingales, but they're in scrub and blackthorn mixtures mm -hmm. rather than hedgerows. Mm -hmm. So we've got some, you know, nice habitat there. We've got a lot of scrub coming through, which could take over. I've had mixed messages about putting chipping on the ground that might make the it too um, uh, nutrient rich for some of the more delicate flowers. Um, we. There is a huge number of deer, so we've got to re reduce those. So we've got big browse lines and stuff. Sorry, I'm probably being a bit specific here. But our soil's clay, and it's very cracked in places. And I think maybe the lack of undergrowth, or even where there are grasslands, is contributing to that too. Yeah, I mean, uh, the grazing systems that I do, I'm very much focused on looking at, s at soil health. Um, and actually wood chip we do use. We use it as cattle bedding in the winter and I generally bring cattle in so I don't have to use ivermectin any, t any of the rest of the time of the year. And I think that is quite important within a, within a system where you're trying to restore, certainly if you're looking at soil. 
So help restore the soil. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and I would also say on that, if you have habitat, like I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not aiming to ever create just the habitat of the meadows. I'm very interested mm -hmm. in keeping the whole thing. And actually that's where the mob grazing really comes in. Because you know, we have willow beds, that, that cattle would destroy, but actually because they're only there for a very short amount of time, it, it's more beneficial for, for, for everything. And can I graze through things like ant mounds, because we have old ant mounds and stuff, but there's scrub coming up through them, so we don't want to lose those. I mean, I graze anywhere, but, that, but that's not within the technicalities of the yeah. law, and yeah. some of these things, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'd say ant, ant, it depends on the ant species, but if, if it's black on... Black and yellow. Pardon? We've got some black and some yellow. Okay, so the yellow meadow ant is definitely a grassland species. It's not that shade tolerant. Um, it does need, a, a, it's kind of a classic species of ancient grazed pastures rather than meadows because sometimes the hills have been there for quite a long time. I, I know I worked on a site where the site manager tried to persuade me that some of the ant hills were 300 years old. And it, he wasn't lying, he believed it, but it just seems so extraordinary that that can be true. And if you were to take a hay cut, you could certainly damage that. Mm, and no, I, I think if it sounds like you're starting with a site that's quite floristically diverse, where well, the scrub has value, and yeah. that's why you've got yeah. the nightingales and other mm. things, but um, scrub encroachment is probably a, 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 a challenge. So yeah, grazing at the correct time of year not when all of the flowers are there, but l slightly later in the year. So late summer through the winter, potentially on a site that's heavy clay, winter grazing might be worse than, than summer grazing because you can cause compaction. But yeah, th think carefully about where you spread your wood chip. We were talking, I think, in the context of wood chip being useful for planted trees mm. to limit competition, um, not as a kind of general soil treatment for meadows. I, th I think you, you can obviously kind of cause a bit of harm if you just spread it indiscriminately. So dead hedges and stuff might be a better idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to quickly sort of reinforce and reiterate the point about using natural colonization to create um, wood meadows. I've um, been involved in a previous uh, role for the last decade with the National Trust um, beginning to create wood meadows from intensive arable farmland using natural colonization. Um, and uh, the method we used was ex extremely low maintenance uh, in terms of just letting the land go for a full season and then walking through and identifying the saplings that were coming up. And all we did was put a bit of hazard tape on them. Um, uh, no protection other than that whatsoever. So you could see them from a tractor and then uh, continue to take a hay cut from, from the field after that. That was the, the management process to start to bring, it was cut and removed to bring the nutrient levels down, 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 down. Um, we didn't uh, mulch or protect the saplings in any way, shape or form other than marking them so we wouldn't mow them with the tractor. Um, and over 13 years, um, they came away and fully established and grew much quicker than any, and more successfully and with a more um, aesthetically pleasing and natural look than than any planting would have ever done in terms of uh, um, you know, removing livestock from the equation where it's more a meadow. That's uh, you know, another approach that I've had success with. And you know, we're, we're really seeing that on the, on the marginal land, that the, the tree, even with the cattle, because they're there for a very short amount of time, and also think of your rest periods. You really need to, even for creation of any meadow, you really need to think of your rest periods for your delicates to, to, to come in the, in the right grasses. But the trees that we're seeing growing, and this is coming from <coughs> professional foresters, are far better than the trees that they would consider if they'd planted and then protected and come in from somewhere else. You know, that the, they, they are saying that the, that the regeneration of the, of the woodland that is there with the use of the cattle is, is better, basically. Which is quite, and not something that I would necessarily predict. But you know, if a cow's there for two days, yeah, it might eat some. It might nibble some, but it's not killing it. And actually, the plant that then comes back is 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 a strong kind of. Yeah, especially if you're trying to create the the, the pasture in a challenging location. Um, this is all in Cornwall, by the way. Um, is quite a challenging place to get trees to um, become successfully established, especially in coastal locations. So because of that, ge the genetics. You know, you're using the sea source from. Um, very well-established woodland on site, which 
demonstrates through its very existence that it has the genetics to thrive long term in that location because that is the seed source you're using with very little in the way of failures, uh, almost non-existent and in drought conditions as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, I would really back that up as well. What if you didn't mow it? I mean, if we didn't mow it, it would have um, the nutrient levels would have stayed incredibly high because it was in it was in broccoli fields before. Um, so you would have get a lot of willow coming in. You'd have get a lot of scrub, and it would turn into a, a, a big blanket of dense scrub. Um, certainly, any um, oak saplings, which are the ones that we were trying to encourage, would have been would have been smothered in that instance. So if you couldn't grow it, you'd have to use cattle on it. You'd have to protect the saplings. Yeah. What should you do with your worms? Um, it depends on the field. Some fields were more botanically valuable than others. Certain, certain mowings were spread in bales as green hay in other fields to, to spread the seed source, especially when we started to get things like yellow rattle come up. Now, obviously, over time, what we were um, observing coming up was, was becoming more and more diverse, so that became more and more a viable approach. Um, but otherwise, we were just sort of cutting them, removing them, and dumping them somewhere discreet otherwise. Can I just add... <laughs> Something sure. quickly on, on, on the back of what, what you were just saying. I was speaking to a friend earlier today who was telling me about a site where the landowner had assumed they would need to reseed an intensively grazed pasture to create meadow, and they were persuaded to watch and wait for a season and see what came up. And three years later, having done nothing except encourage that natural regeneration of the meadow, they're selling green hay for 500 pounds per hectare. Um, so it's, it's generating significant income from no capital investment whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'll struggle to get green hay where you've got a lot of anthills though, because again, it's just oh, no, difficult. It's just okay. Yeah. Okay, um, unless there are any more burning, oh yeah, one more. We'll call you the last question. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just intrigued in the uh, difference between wood pasture and wood meadow. Is it the cutting or is it the allowing to mature and seed of the grasses or is there some other, some other action that makes the wood meadow so much more diverse? So, so the terminology historically was the same as the distinction between meadow and pasture. It was, was there hay cutting, in which case it was classified as meadow. It, it's changing and it's changing not just in the UK but across Europe to grasslands that we value because of their botanical diversity. We call them wildflower meadows and we've, we've started using meadow to describe something where a grassland is really, really valuable for wildlife. It's a meadow, even if it's a pasture. And so in, in the Baltic states, they have traditional wooded meadow systems that used to be managed through cutting and aftermath grazing. In Estonia, they now keep all of their livestock indoors all year round. And so their meadows are exclusively cut and not grazed at all. They're still quite botanically diverse, but they are suffering, I think. They, they don't want to hear it, but I think they're, they're getting slightly worse. Um, in Latvia, they have a far more undulating landscape than Estonia. Same historic management system, but they now don't cut because it's impractical. They're exclusively grazed, but they still refer to them as the same Fenoscandian wooded meadow habitat type in the, in the EU's Habitats Directive. But they're both very proud of their management regime, even though one exclusively grazes, one exclusively mows, but they're both meadows. And they both have other habitats in their country that they refer to as wood pasture that's distinct. And it's still really valuable because of the mosaic, but it's not as botanically diverse. So I think, for me, I'm quite comfortable with it being a slightly overarching intention. I call it a wood meadow when I'm thinking about both the trees and the field layer. And what I'd really like to see in the UK is from both directions. When you're planning your agroforestry projects, that there's just that point where you consider, what can I do to enhance the field layer as well as putting the trees in? And in the same same vein when you have a grassland in Estonia can you tell I just got back from Estonia they, they define the value of a grassland the same way we do we do there's a tick box system one of their criteria is if it's got between 10 and 20 percent scrub cover in any grassland that's a good thing because it improves the quality of the habitat and its value for livestock um, 
I'd quite like it if we could get to that place in the UK where we value mixed systems instead of being so keen to compartmentalise and consider one habitat at a time. Hope that answers it. Um, listen, I think that's been a fantastic way to uh, end this first day. Brilliant speakers, um, both of you, thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to show your appreciation. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.